welcome to another great edition of Mississippi Stories. I am your host, Marshall Ramsey, editor-at-large and editorial cartoonist for Mississippi Today. And of course, our uh, Mississippi Stories is sponsored by the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and we'll tell you a little bit about them toward the end. But I want to thank them for sponsoring today's episode. And, you know, this is coming out on Memorial Day weekend. And obviously our guest today is still with us. So technically uh, he, it, it was more of a Veterans Day program, but I wanted to have him on because uh, he's a guy that I've gotten to know a little bit thanks to a little bit of providence and a little bit of luck. And I've really grown to really like and respect him. And he's had an incredible career serving our country. And I wanted him to talk a little bit about some of the great things that he's been able to do and some of them maybe the not so great, maybe smaller things as well. Um, Brigadier General Maxie Phillips is with us. He started, I guess, in the military in 1962, retired around 1999. I may have those dates off a little bit, but you've had a, you had a long and distinguished career that involved fighter jets and command and all kinds of fun things, and one turkey buzzard that I'm going to have you tell us a little bit about, too. And I, before I get started too far, I heard you say this Saturday, somebody referred to you as general and you said no it's maxi that the general part was in my past so if i say is it okay for me to call you maxi absolutely i prefer I, otherwise i might quit talking to you okay well I, you know i'm not going to argue with the general i mean wait with maxi on that so so anyway maxi how are you doing today i'm doing fine i'm uh, you know pushing 82 and i'm just uh, blessed and fortunate to be able to uh, be in relatively good health for my age and uh, and enjoy life still and and so I'm doing great. Eighty two. That's uh, that's uh, you know, like I said, and you're you are you're up and about and you're getting going. And now you you said you joined the military in sixty two. Did you grow up in Mississippi? I did. I grew up in the uh, I guess what we call the the hill country of northeast Mississippi, and. Uh, more like Appalachia than down in the uh, Delta area. But yeah, I was born, raised there, a uh, little small family farm. You know, it's more or less uh, uh, subsistence farming and uh, went to school there, a little uh, school. Uh, most people uh, have to look on the map to find it, Kasuth, uh, or the folks who are not around there say it, call it Kasuth, but it's actually Kasuth. That's how the natives pronounce it. but uh, finished school there, went and then went uh, to uh, university at that uh, prestigious university in Starkville, Mississippi State. Yeah, but that's where I, that's where I originated from. What'd you get your degree in engineering? Yeah, I, at Mississippi State uh, in aeronautical engineering. Okay, so you had you had airplanes on your mind at that point, anyway. Yeah, that began. That, that interest began in the cotton fields uh, when I was just a, just a kid. You know, we lived under the traffic pattern of the local airport up there, the Roscoe Turner Field. And uh, I remember in the early days, I was, I was born, I was the year before Pearl Harbor. So um, I was, uh, had memories from before World War II. It had ended, and uh, a lot of uh, T6 Texans from a base, uh, training base over in Alabama would come over and shoot approaches, take off some landings at, uh, at the little airport uh, there near Corinth. And I would see them fly over. And you know, you're familiar with the Texans, those big old radial engines. And it's just, and I'd be down there chopping cotton and look up and think, Lord, I. I would much rather be up there than down here doing this. And that was, in my, in my recollection, that is the earliest uh, thing that I remember being motivated uh, toward flying. And it just grew from there. But I never had any, any uh, second thoughts about what I wanted to do. So and you... I thought nautical engineering would be a good lead in to that. But, and it was. I about to say was, I mean, how did you, I mean, I, a lot of people don't realize that being a pilot is a lot more than just sitting in the cockpit and, you know, you know, literally pulling the stick and hitting the rudders and so forth. I mean, there's a, there, there's a lot of math and science involved with it too. There, there really is. There really is. And if you don't, you don't have to have that kind of background, but it served me well. Um, when I went into pilot training after, uh, after, um, 
college, uh, uh, some of the guys are just a mixture of uh, my classmates. Some of them were business majors or ag majors or uh, teachers, uh, education majors. And when we hit the subjects of uh, aerodynamics, some of them really, really struggle. Matter of fact, I was, I was assigned by a class commander to tutor some of those guys to help get, get through <laughs> those subjects, which to me was very, at that point, was very elementary, you know, but to them, it was, it was Mount Everest. So uh, I helped them get over it. Did you do ROTC in college or did you just go? Yeah. Yeah. So you came, went, you, yeah. So you came out as a first lieutenant. Second, second lieutenant. lieutenant. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, I went to the Air Force ROTC there, at Mississippi State. Okay. And Got so that, there. when, when you signed up, did, I mean, where did you, where did you sign up? And I mean, obviously, you know, of course, and 62 is right, right. That's the year you went in. Uh, that was the year. Yeah. I graduated and went into the Air Force. Yeah. The world so, was, yeah, the world was, um, I lost your picture there for a second. Um, the world was, yeah. Yeah, the world was a little bit crazier at that point. I mean, we were looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so we were in the height of the Cold War. So, when you, um, when you, when you signed up, where did they to begin with? Where did you do your pilot training? And then, did you think when you went in, I want to get into fighter planes, or did you know what you want, what you were going to get into? Well, ninety nine percent of the uh, the wannabe pilots wanted to go into fighters. You know, not all yeah. of us could or did, but that's that's sort of the dream, I guess. And uh, so that's I was in that group. That's what I wanted to do. I went to pilot training at uh, Craig Air Force Base in uh, just outside Selma, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been long closed now, but yeah. uh, that was that was where uh, I met uh, entered active duty, met my uh, 40 some odd classmates in my pilot training class from all over the country. And um, uh, that's where it, that was 13 months of training before we earned our wings and uh, were ready to go on and into what we considered the real Air Force. You know, this sort of, that was the training was it was great and we had it was a challenge every day, but uh, so rewarding. And uh, most of us made it through. We had a few that didn't for various reasons, either medical or um, it just wasn't what their cup of tea and they, uh, what we call SIE or self-initiated elimination. And some, most stayed in the Air Force and other, you know, the capacities, but uh, about, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I, I probably about 85% uh, of it made it through with no problem. Yeah, on my way down from, um... From here down to my sister's house in Dothan, we went past that Air Force Base. So that was kind of interesting to see that and see it. And it's now closed and they're trying to rehab parts of it. But anyway, I, I thought that was fascinating. Did you, what what planes did you train on? Did you train on the, uh, like the T-37, T-38 or what What did you train on? Well, the first, the first aircraft was a T-37. That was the primary training. About half the year was spent uh, on that airplane. And then um, Craig, along with one other base, I think there were a total of seven training uh, bases, Air Force training bases scattered around the, the southern U.S. Um, Craig and one other base had not yet converted to the T-38. We still had the old vin uh, vintage T-33, mm -hmm. what we call the T-Bird, uh, which we felt a little... Uh, we're second class here, but <laughs> as it turned out, I was happy uh, that I trained in that airplane because it was more demanding. It was old. It was more complicated, particularly mechanically, than the T-38 was. So I think in a way it prepared me a little better for, for what, what came later. They still use the T-38s up at Columbus, don't they? They do. Uh, they, um, they, yes, um, of course, I think a lot of the T-38s, they have converted to um, more of a fighter lead-in. Yeah. And um, 
because it's still the high performance airplane, but but it's been around a long, long time. And so it's getting, or it's long in the tooth, uh, uh, but it's been a good one, as was the old uh, T-Bird. Yeah, the T-Bird, wasn't that built off the, the P-80, which was the the first the right. first jet, by American jet from Lockheed? Yeah, the first one that was through combat, the old uh, P-80. Yeah. Uh, later, they changed the designation to F to fighter, but P stood for pursuit. Uh, all the World War II fighters were P this or P that, P-38, P-51, but now uh, then changed later to F So fighter. So so suddenly the military had taken you from a cotton field up in North Mississippi to seeing the world. That's pretty amazing. Yes. yes. It was, it was a dream come true for me. Uh, that was, you know, to be in the air force, to be an air force pilot. Uh, when I finished at Craig and got uh, my Sandra pinned on my silver wings, I had arrived. That's how I felt. I had arrived. Whatever <laughs> lay ahead. <laughs> I mean, that was just gravy, but, when did, did, when, Maxie, when did you get married? Uh, right out of uh, college. Okay. Uh, in 62. And about oh, a month later, uh, we headed to uh, Selma to uh, start our new life. Uh, we had everything we owned in the, in the back seat and trunk of my car, including <laughs> a, a used television that a friend of mine had given me as a wedding present. <laughs> We started from scratch and pay was not that good back then for a second lieutenant. Uh, but we, you know, we, we made it. We, it, uh, we, we were, we were young. Uh, we were happy and money was not on the, even on the, the, the scope for what we, what we needed. Now I, I, I I've met your son and, um, how many kids do y'all have? We have three kids. Mark, who you know, yeah. uh, was, was born there in Selma about uh, uh, 10 months after we arrived. Uh, it's funny. We, we used to kid the guys in the class about something about this water. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> little babies started popping up around toward the end of our, our training period. Uh, but anyway, he was born there, and I have two daughters that came later. And right now, we have seven grandkids, and uh, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but we've got three great grandkids and another on the way. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, it's 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 just uh, phenomenal, I, I, in the sense of how lucky and how blessed we are with uh, our family. I mean, what a, I mean, what a great way to start out your marriage with a used television, a car and, and a little bit of money. And then 10 months down the road, a baby boy. And uh, it, when you got your first assignment out of training, where did you end up going? And of course, obviously, she came with you, didn't she? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, there were, of course, as we mentioned before, there were uh, a bunch of us wanted to go into fighters. But at the end of our training, what, the way the Air Force worked it, uh, if there were 41 guys in our class, 41 assignments came down and we were graded and ranked throughout the year. You got grades on your uh, mm -hmm. flying, on the check rides, you got grades on your academics, you got grades on more of a subjective thing called uh, military training. But uh, all of that combined gave you a, a, a score and the whole class was ranked. Top guy, when assignments came down, got his pick of 41 assignments. He could pick whichever one he wanted. Number two guy got 40, uh, picked from 40. On down the line to the last poor guy, there was one assignment left that had been picked over by all his classmates, and that's what he wound up with. So there was a lot of really competition within the, the class to to finish as high as you possibly could. Um, so uh, the first, the, the list of assignments came down. There were eight F-4s mm -hmm. to uh, MacDill Air Force Base. Um, and uh, unfortunately it was high enough in the class standing to uh, get one of those, but they were to the uh, 
you know, the F-4 is a two-place airplane, and they were all to the, uh, to the, to the back seat of the F-4. But there were no other fighters. All the fighters went to the T-38 bases. The, poor T, the two T-33 bases only could only, the only fighter that was on the list was the F-4. So uh, as it turned out, that was, that was uh, we were fortunate in that regard too. Very fortuitous so, on that. But I mean, at that time, the F-4 was really the premier fighter in the Air Force and the Navy, I mean, as well. Well, yeah, the, at that, that time, the Air Force didn't even have the, their own F-4s. The training squadron I went to at MacDill uh, had borrowed about 20 F-4Bs on loan from the Navy. The Navy had had the airplane for a few years. Yeah. The Air Force F-4s, the F-4C was in production, but had not none had been delivered yet. So we trained in the F-4B, the Navy uh, F-4. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and I know how well the, the different uh, uh, branches would get along too. So that had to be weird flying around in Navy planes. Well, it, it, it was uh, in, a, in a sense. One big difference was their refueling. Uh, they yeah. did refueling differently. They used what was called a probe and drogue. Uh, uh, the Air Force used what was called a boom and receptacle. Um, on a probe and drogue, which the Air Force still used to some extent. Some of the early fighters were probe and drove, like the F-100, mm -hmm. F-84. Um, and then some of the later ones uh, could go either way. The F-105, the F-1, RF-101 had both probe and drove and boom and receptacle. So you could uh, take a choice. And then later, Air Force switched exclusively to boom and receptacle where basically the boom operator and the tanker uh, uh, sort of ran the show. The, the receiver, the fighter would just pull up in position underneath uh, the tanker and uh, the boom operator would uh, maneuver the boom, extend it, move it up, down, sideways, and, and uh, plug it into the receptacle on the, on the receiver. Uh, so they did most work, but the old probe drove the tanker was just trailing a, what we call a basket, a long hose with a, uh, what looked like a basket on the end. You had to maneuver your airplane to plug the, uh, the probe into the basket. You know, nobody's helping you if you had to do that part, so it's all on the, the pilot. But uh, yeah, we said it looked kind of like a birdie on a badminton for when you play badminton and you had to you had to fly up and stick it in there. And I guess they use C-130s for that. I know the, the Marine Corps does and so forth. And the Air Force, if you go by Meridian, you see the KC-135s there. That's what they did the refueling with back then. They still do. Oh, they do. The 135 yeah. talk about an old airplane, too. It's been around a, a long, long time. And it's done a great job. It's been re-engined uh, a number of years ago, uh, which was a huge improvement because it was uh, it was basically pretty underpowered for, for heavyweight takeoffs. Um, so, but yeah, it's still in operation and will be, I think, for foreseeable future. There's a new My tanker. Father, yeah, and the new one just came out. They're still testing yeah. it, yeah. My uh, my father in law flew one of the 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 KC one thirty fives over in Vietnam, so he he got a little bit of experience on that. But Maxie, I mean, I mean, literally, you know, your wife and you got a baby, and you're t you're you're traveling around. You are now in an F four. Um, Vietnam gets started. Obviously, uh, it was in the beginning of the. You know, you think about the early days in, in the mid sixties when it really started getting going. But at what point did you know that you were going to end up going to Vietnam? Well, after we had finished training at uh, McDill and had, re had received our the, the F-4Cs in, in force, uh, there were eight squadrons at McDill. This is the whole ramp from here to yonder was covered in F-4s, two wings, eight squadrons. And uh, at that time, early on, Cuban Missile Crisis was, has just, you know, was very recent history. And there was still a lot of focus on Cuba. Mm -hmm. 
including, you know, uh, the air crews, a lot of mission planning in the event that we had to go into Cuba. Yeah, and, and that's Cuba was sort of a focus. And then along about uh, early, I guess, 65, the focus started changing to Vietnam. And uh, by the middle of the middle of the year, the rumors were coming pretty heavy that, hey, we're, we're uh, probably going to deploy there. And, and a few squadrons did. Mm-hmm. And then in um, uh, October, I think it was, of 65, uh, my squadron deployed to uh, the new base there. Um, I had never heard of it or started hearing about it, didn't know where it was. Knew it was in Southeast Asia somewhere, didn't know it was in Vietnam, it was in Thailand, or wherever it'd get a map to see where Cameron Bay is. Well, it was a new base uh, on the uh, coast of South China Sea in the Southern part of South Vietnam. And they were also building a um, major port facility and warehouse facility that was going to become the major logistics center for uh, Southeast Asia, for the whole war effort there. And um, and had airfield built uh, as part of that logistics complex. And that's where we deployed to. Four squadrons wound up there, as well as a lot of uh, cargo and um, it was a busy it was a busy place yeah um i, I would say the cameron bay is a long way from mississippi it is <laughs> <laughs> talk about that pro- i mean that process you guys had to fly literally i mean across the whole pacific ocean i'm sure you stopped several places along the way you get there how long did the tour last and how many i mean was it like world war ii where you had to fly x a number of, of flights some no, number of missions or was there um was it just for a, a calendar year uh, amount of time well the answer is yes and yes okay uh, it it uh the tour for an air crew was either 100 uh 100 missions over north vietnam or one year whichever came first okay well for us um uh, being so far south, we didn't get that many missions into North Vietnam because if you went any further than what we call the panhandle of North Vietnam, which counted as a, as a mission over North Vietnam, you had to have air refueling. Right. So most of, the, most of the missions over North Vietnam fell to the bases that were closer to North Vietnam, the, the bases in Thailand and the one uh, Air Force Base at Da Nang, which was up near just mm-hmm. south of the DMZ. So we, most of our missions were in support of the Army, close air support, interdiction missions into Laos, uh, hitting the Ho Chi Minh Trail that came down through uh, Laos into South Vietnam. Uh, that was the bulk of ours. However, they did modify the, the policy a little bit okay, you, you're, we're not in position to get 100 missions before our one year, but they allowed us for every, either 20 or 25 missions over North Vietnam, you could get one month knocked off your tour. So I managed, I think I had the 27 or 28 missions over North Vietnam, so I came home one month early. My tour was 11 months and not a full year. My 11 months is definitely better than 12, I would imagine. So um, let, me, let me ask you what it was like. Cause I mean, you know, I mean, number one, I know on the F4, uh, initially they had trouble with it cause it didn't have guns on it. You know, it, it had, you know, for dog fights, if it was dog fighting a yeah. MiG-21, which had, which was a nimble aircraft. Um, it was, you know, you, you ended up having issues cause sometimes you get in close and you couldn't deal with it cause you'd had missiles. And also too, I know the surface to air missiles in, in Vietnam were historically, uh, troublesome to say the least. You can ask the, the folks in the Hanoi Hilton about that one a little bit. When you were flying in that 11 months, did you ever come under fire or ever have any real difficulty flying? Um, uh, we were. Uh, at Cameron, we didn't face the type of defenses that the bases that were flying way up in the northern part of North Vietnam around Hanoi, yeah. the Port Typhoon. They were dealing with uh, much heavier defenses than we typically did in the south. 
on the missions that we did go north, and some of those missions were escort missions. Uh, for example, the uh, EB-66, which was an electronic warfare aircraft, but had no defense. It was subsonic. Uh, on strike missions, the big strike missions, it would go up and set up an orbit around the uh, northwest of Hanoi, dropping chaff uh, to spoil the radars uh, and, uh, and also using electronic jamming uh, to help protect the strike force. And we, but because they were defenseless, they had to have uh, escort. Mm -hmm. So we would go up occasionally and escort them. And uh, of course it took a couple of refuelings to go up and, and do that and, and back. But uh, um, that was the only time that we really, uh, only time I ever saw a MiG, for example, we never had MiGs in the, in the South. Yeah, they didn't come that far south. They didn't. They couldn't. They didn't have the range. Um, but uh, apparently, uh, they would come up in order to draw us away from the EB sixty six, so that um, their cohorts coming from another uh, direction back there could attack it. So we were told not, never to leave that that aircraft, the, the B sixty six. So as soon as we turned into the MiGs, them, they'd be off maybe, you know, a mile or more. And uh, uh, they just hightail it out of there. And so we'd have to stay with it. But that was the only time I ever saw MiGs, period. Huh. Uh, and, and I think they were just trying to, you know, pull us off. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, although the, the SAMs were, were, were there, they were not in large numbers yet. Later, uh, yeah, it was much more of a threat, the SAM, the SAM threat. And, uh, and the poor guys uh, out of Thailand, uh, particularly were, it was, it was a constant battle with them. And then they developed the, uh, the, the uh, SAM killers, the wild weasel, mm -hmm. they called them. The aircraft was specifically designed to go after. You didn't try to avoid the SAM. They were looking for them and to to uh, to knock them out. That was a that, about all the missions. That was probably the most uh, hazardous fighter missions in in Vietnam was the the, uh, the wild weasels. Yeah, that would that would have taken I, I think a special brand of aviator to raise your hand for doing that one, to say the least. Yeah, or, or you got to take some kind of pills. <laughs> well, that, that's probably a little more realistic, actually, to be honest with you. Maxie, what was it like? I mean, obviously, we've heard what it's like in the air, but what was it like when you're on the ground? Because, I mean, you weren't flying 24-7 every day. I mean, you were flying whenever you could get up or whenever the deal was. I mean, there was a whole lot of downtime, too. What was it like being in Vietnam? Huh, boring. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, you know... I get we we complain about the living conditions. No, we lived in uh, forty some odd guys living in a small Quonset hut, uh, you know, double bunks and whatnot. But you know, and the food was, you know, I, I got so so hungry for just some good fresh milk because all you're eating, you know, you had you're eating dried eggs and uh, reconstituted milk, which didn't to me didn't taste like it. But anyway. We complained about the little things, but uh, but we knew we had it pretty good uh, compared to the army. Yeah, my brother, uh, my younger brother, was uh, went over as an infantryman about three years later, and his living conditions he would have he would have thought he was in heaven to have had the accommodations that we had, you know, slogging through the jungle and and. Uh, for a week on end, but you know, living in the same clothes, never having a, a moment, not a moment that you were not under possible threat. Yeah. Uh, that was that there was no comparison uh, between their conditions and our conditions. Uh, but I tell you one of the one of the um, really things that I treasure coming out of that. When you live and eat and work with the same guys 
that you're living, you know, within uh, just a few feet of all the time, you develop a camaraderie that's just absolutely impossible to have that kind of camaraderie in any other occupation, I don't think. And then when you do lose someone, it is it hits pretty hard, but you have to, you know, you have to sort of, I guess, not become callous to it, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, the guy Jake breakfast with this morning, he's, he's gone. Yeah. Shot down, didn't come back. Um, you got to press on anyway. I mean, uh, could have, could have happened to me just as easy as it could have happened to him. And you know that, and you, you said, but, uh, but you got to press on. Uh, but I think that's why those military reunions, old guys getting together years later is that's why it is, uh, that, that bonding, that camaraderie that developed between particular and, in, in a combat unit, um, there's, there's a tie there that it's hard to it's hard to describe it's hard to define but it's there and those we we there's one squadron we still we've got a reunion coming up uh, in about another week it may be our last one but, but uh just because of the age and fewer more and more are find it unable to come or they've passed away whatever yeah but that's, it doesn't matter. It can be 50 years since you've seen each other, but the, the years just evaporate instantly. And you just pick up where you left off. I would think it makes Memorial Day that much more special for you. It, you can you can appreciate Memorial Days in ways that I'll never be able to appreciate it. Yeah, I, uh, um, I think about the guys, even though we were in the South, we still lost airplanes. Yeah. Uh, we lost through accidents. We lost them to ground fire because you're you're flying low, although fast. You're flying low in uh, close air support, and uh, for example, and uh, they're shooting at you with everything they got, small arms. But uh, we still lost lost some airplanes that way. And um, yeah, I I don't I have been to the Vietnam Memorial several times. And um, when I go there, if I'm with somebody, when I start seeing the names, in particular the names that I know, you know, it's like I, all of a sudden I'm alone yeah. because uh, I'm alone with those memories. They're so they're so fresh. It's like yesterday, and uh, I, I can I can see their faces. I can see them laughing. I can hear their voices is clearly you know i yeah. recognize them instantly uh, and um, one name on that on the wall is uh, really special is my uncle uh, who was more like a big brother to me he was uh, i was about halfway age-wise between he and dad yeah. and he was an army aviator he was my ins big inspiration to me wanted to be like him and uh, and uh, when he when he was shot down in a Chinook helicopter uh, and killed, uh, that 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 really hurt me. Yeah. And uh, and when I see his name. Hey, all bets are off. Don't talk to me. I can't talk. Yeah. What's <laughs> what, what was his name? So that next time I go up there, I can look for him. William Russell Phillips. Okay. Uh, we call him Uncle Russell. Yeah. And he left. He left a wife and five kids. Wow. The, the oldest of which was sixteen. Yeah. Um, and that family, I mean, that loss. I mean, it's been decades and decades, but that loss still reverberates throughout that family. Um, How so? Yeah. They'll never. They'll never. The kids will never get over it. The grandkids, yeah. which are, you know, they never knew him. It'll be easier for them. But for me, uh, you know, it's it's tough to see, but it's important too. Yeah, 
definitely. This is something that I cherish that you gave me. I'll try to hold it up here. This is a challenge coin that you gave me from, from your squadron from Vietnam. Yeah, which, uh, top, top up there is Cameron Bay. Yeah. Over the left is MacDill Air Force Base. And the other one, which I never was there, Phuket, mm -hmm. there's another base in, in South Vietnam where uh, elements, after I had left Cameron, some elements of, the, uh, of that wing uh, deployed to uh, okay. Phuket. So they're flying out of both places. I think so Cameron had gotten so busy, it was hard to uh, yeah. one runway uh, to, uh, to accommodate all the traffic. It was like flying in and out of Hartsfield, I would imagine. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> so this was from 1962 to 1971. So and you did, you, how many tours did you do in Vietnam? Did you do just one? I just did one. Uh, when I left there, um, I was assigned to a fighter squadron in uh, England. Okay. I stayed there for four years until 1970. And uh, your family got to come with you on that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mark, uh, he was still, a, he was, um, what, two or three, three, I guess then. And, uh, yeah. So he, he grew up, we had, uh, our first daughter came along born there and, uh, which by the way, uh, made her a British citizen, <laughs> a British birth certificate. And she could, if she wanted to claim her British citizenship, she could to this day, but, uh, She's decided not to. Um, Does she cry yeah. with the British accent? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't know. I guess because she was in our household, uh, yeah. we, we didn't, she didn't uh, pick that up too much, nor did Mark while he was there. Yeah. Did you fly the F-4 over there also? Yeah. Yeah. The mission was very different. Uh, there, uh, there were there were quite a number of fighter units, U.S. fighter units in Europe. Uh, un, uh, several several uh, bases in Germany mm -hmm. and uh, and in England also. And uh, our mission was a nuclear strike. Although we maintain capability in all the conventional yeah. weapons endeavors. Because it could, if you know, the Soviets were the big threat. The Warsaw Pact uh, in Eastern Europe was uh, so that was what that was what we uh, uh, and for a fighter with a limited range, it's not a B fifty two that can go. Uh, our our targets uh, that we set alert on were all in Eastern Europe, not in the yes. Soviet Union. Uh, well, per se, uh, the Warsaw Pact was not part of the Soviet Union, but uh, that's where most of our targets were in Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, uh, targets that we could reach from unrefueled that we didn't have, would not have any refueling support. And uh, it was a doomsday thing because if it ever, if they ever broke out the, the nukes, uh, yeah. it's all over it's all over we didn't we didn't expect to come back uh, because we knew our base at uh, RAF Bentwaters was a prime Soviet target and if they start lobbing nukes at each other if we could make it back probably wouldn't be anything there but a big scorched place in the earth so and that's where our families were too so yeah. It was, uh, fortunately, we, it, it never happened, but, you know, you're sitting out there on quick, quick reaction alert at times. If, uh, if the horn sounded, uh, that was the end of the world as we knew it. Wow. That's, that's, that's how we viewed it. And uh, thank God that never happened, you know. So. I kind of hope, it, yeah, I hope that doesn't happen again. I mean, you know, it's. It's like the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, here we've got the threats and everything going on. You were in England for four years, and obviously um, that had to be good duty because, you know, England's probably a little bit less boring than Vietnam, I would imagine, uh, getting to see the, see that. And it was great for your kids to kind of get a taste of, of, of 
of a different part of the world a little bit. Where did you go after you left England? Uh, after I left England, um, I, I left the Air Force. Okay. It, uh, it was 1970. Mm -hmm. uh, the war in uh, Southeast Asia, although it went on for a few more years, uh, it was being turned over more and more to the Vietnamese. Uh, and in the interim, because uh, there had been so many pilots, uh, the pilot training process had, had really ginned up and they pumped out so many pilots. In 1970, there's almost a surplus of pilots in the Air Force. Yeah. So when I start looking at follow on assignments, well, you might get a flying assignment or you might not. You might wind up as an administrative officer somewhere or a finance officer, a personnel officer. And Marshall, I wasn't through flying. Yeah. I to, and I knew every Air National Guard unit in the, uh, in the States was needing pilots. Air Force had too many. The Air Guard didn't have enough. And... Uh, and uh, had several buddies that gotten out in, mm -hmm. in a few years prior, had gone, were flying for the airlines and flying for the guard. So I said, well, that sounds like a good alternative. I was not interested in going back to Vietnam at that point. The main reason being, aside from leaving family for another year, was it was, had become quite obvious that the U.S. was looking for an exit door. Yeah. Trying to find some way, save face, and get out of Vietnam, turn it over to the Vietnamese and get out of there. And uh, so it was uh, um, almost sense, well, we've given up, so, uh, so why? I just didn't have, I didn't have it in my heart to, to go back into those uh, situations. So, uh, you know, I think, well, I've got an obligation to the family as well as to my country. And uh, that's so that that was uh, why I, I made. Uh, oh, another another reason too that sort of sealed the deal for me was I had been, uh, I had that degree in aeronautical, aeronautical engineering. I've been flying F 4s at over 2,000 hours flying time then. I had, I, on sense upgraded to the front seat. I'd, I'd gotten all the credentials, instructor, pilot, flight examiner, maintenance test pilot, flight lead, all, all that. I could I had all that. And I wanted really bad to, uh, because my heroes back when I was just a kid were the, uh, the Chuck Yeagers and the, uh, the Pete Everest and the guys flying the X-Planes and out at the Edwards. Um, they were my heroes too. And, uh, I was trying to get into, uh, Air Force test pilot school at Edward. I had all the credentials, at least, uh, met the requirements as stated. Uh, but they would have a class every six months about, uh, somewhere around 20 or 30 guys. I would apply. I never made it. Uh, six months later, I'd apply again. Finally, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Am I competitive to this thing or not? What's my chances? Or do they have any chance at all? And uh, one of the uh, majors in the squadron said uh, uh, he knew what I was trying to do. And he said, Maxie, uh, Chuck Yeager has just, he was still on active duty as a brigadier general then. He'd just been assigned as vice commander of 17th Air Force over at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. Uh, and he just came from being commandant of the test pilot school at Edwards. He and I are good friends. I used to uh, fly in, in a unit, uh, F-100 unit, when he was squadron commander, and we still get together. He said, uh, if you want, I get you an appointment. You can go over and talk to him, and he can tell you, you, have a, you do you have a snowball's chance in Hades or not to, to make the, the cut? Of course, I was, uh, I was uh, anxious just to meet the guy. Yeah, just to meet Chuck Yeager, who's a hero all yeah. the way around, yeah. So he went, that guy's name was Bill McAdoo. He went with me, and uh, we, he called over and got an appointment. And uh, he told me, he said, don't, don't 
bother carrying a uniform, just flight, just wear a flight suit. We'll fly over in F4 and, and uh, uh, he's a very informal guy. So, okay. So we get there and, and uh, his office door is open and he sees Bill and he's coming around the desk and they, they hug like long lost brothers. And uh, he shook my hand. He didn't hug me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but they sat there for, I guess, seemed like half an hour talking about hunting and fishing because they're both avid sportsmen. And, and, and I'm just sort of taking it in not part of the conversation really. And finally he gets around, turns around to me and says, uh, well, Captain, I uh, understand you want to go to test pilot school. And I said, yes, yeah, sir. And I'm hoping you can give me some indication if I have a, a chance at it or not. And the first question he asked me, it sort of floored me. He said, are you an academy graduate? Oh, wow. Not. And I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, when I left, uh, you know, after being commandant, he said, that is not a requirement. It's not a, it's not a listed requirement for getting into school, but I can tell you it is a big advantage. Well, that was, uh, I didn't feel too good about that answer. And then he, asked me, he said, how much di diversified flying time do you have in high performance aircraft? I said, all my time had been in the F4. Uh, I didn't have flying time in another high performance aircraft. Uh, well, it was obvious that was not <laughs> the right answer I wanted to hear either. And his last answer was, uh, uh, do you have an advanced degree, i.e. a master's or above, in engineering or one of the technical sciences? I didn't have that. <laughs> And uh, the max age for entrance in test pilot school was 29. I was 29 at that time. Oh, wow. Yeah. So basically, he told me what I wanted to know in, 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 in certain terms. And that is, uh, son, you can't get there from here. <laughs> so on the, on the flight back to England, uh, I was talking to... Uh, Bill McAdoo, I said, well, he told me what I needed to know. Wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it's what I needed to know. And uh, I made my decision. When, by the time we landed back at uh, England, I'd made my decision. Uh, I can't get there from here with that, uh, going to test pilot school. Uh, so I've got to sort of look at, okay, some other goals or whatever. So that was one reason, another big reason. I left the Air Force at that time. But I left it with a lot of reservation too, I must yeah. say, yeah. There aren't many people who can say that they had a life decision that was helped uh, shaped by the man who first broke the sound barrier. So that's that's yeah. pretty cool, Max, even, even though it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out. That's, you know, that's, that's almost like getting to go hang out with Yoda in a way, you know? Yeah, I would have. Uh... I guess it's a good thing I didn't have, you know, didn't have smartphones in to take a selfie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. I can only imagine that. So you got out at that point and obviously the guard was an option and you looked around. Did you go straight to the Mississippi guard? I did at Meridian. Yeah. And uh, I knew, uh, of course, Jackson was here, but they were flying transports and uh, Meridian. They didn't have fighters, but they had photo reconnaissance, and there's a fighter type aircraft. Yeah. Uh, and I sort of wanted to stay in Mississippi or, or in the South. Uh, so I went down and talked to them, and uh, they hired me on the spot uh, as a part timer, not as a full time. It wasn't something I could uh, feed the know, family on. Yeah. But it was. Uh, and at that time, the, the Air Guard was still sort of a getting hand-me-down equipment from the Air Force. They, they were flying the old RF-84, mm -hmm. the old Korea vintage airplane. Uh, and that's what they had. But it's, uh, hey, it's got wings. Uh, <laughs> it'll be, it'll be uh, uh, fun to fly. So that first year, that's what I flew with the... Uh, the guard and I, I got to tell you there's there's a couple of stories there because coming from the F4 to 
something like that. It's like a step back, way back in time. Uh, yeah, I'd imagine it'd be like going from a Porsche to an old Buick. Uh, go back a little further than that, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, an Oldsmobile then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that first takeoff, well, there, are no, there are no simulators for the airplane. There were no two place that trainers. Oh, wow. So, they just brief you. I and say, brief, brief me into submission. And, uh, and with a few, don't do this and um, <laughs> give you the instructor leaning over the uh, canopy rail and showing you how to get the engine started. And then uh, see you later. <laughs> and hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, here's how to eject. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Cool. So that the old uh, the old airplane used a lot of runway. We used to kid about it was built by Republic Aviation. Mm -hmm. They built heavy airplanes. Yeah, they built the P forty seven, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, which was like one of the bigger fighters in World War II. That was a big aircraft, was, also. Yeah, they called yeah. it. Yeah, you know, the official name, the factory name for it was the Thunderbolt. Yeah, uh, pilots called it the Jug. <laughs> And then uh, they built the F-105, too. Mm -hmm. Which also was another big aircraft. Big, air, heavy airplane. Wonderful airplane. And the guys that flew it, I never flew it, but the guys that flew it loved it. Absolutely loved it. And they said that was the Cadillac. Um, but uh, the factory name for it was the Thunder Chief. All the Republic airplanes started with Thunder. Well, the Thunder Chief, the pilots call it the third. <laughs> and it was, and, you were talking about the people up close to the, to the, the border that had to fly into Vietnam and it took the, took the licking that, that was them, the F-105. Those guys took really heavy losses during the war. They did. I, I, I wish I had the number on the tip of my tongue the, the, that they lost the yeah. 105, but they were a bunch of them. And they were carrying the brunt of the war. Yeah. It was, uh, it could carry a heavy load of bombs. The big advantage, it couldn't turn. It was not a very maneuverable airplane because it had a high wing loading. But its big advantage was speed. It could outrun anything low level. It could outrun an F4 low level. Oh, wow. It was, it was a mover. Uh, and that was their advantage. But when you're going up there with a load of bombs, you can't, you can't uh, use that advantage until after you delivered the bombs, then you can use it getting the heck out of Dodge. Uh, if you get low and fast, uh, that was their survival technique. Um, but yeah, for years and years, they carried the brunt of the war and they lost a bunch of them. Um, my hat's off to those guys. Yeah, my father-in-law used to, that was one of the main planes that he refueled. Was they were always refueling the 105s. He, he was based in Thailand, so he, he flew out of there. And he did, I think he did when he was when he was in an EC-121, which was once again, it was, one, it, was a recon, it was a reconnaissance plane that, that was based on an old airliner, just for other folks that are not, you and I know that, but um, for anybody else, but you know, he joked that it was the best tri-motor ever built because they could never keep all four engines going at the same time. So you were flying, you're literally flying old aircraft, but you did that for about a year. It sounds like they finally got you some updated planes up in the Meridian. Yeah, they, uh, we transitioned after that one year uh, into the RF-101. Okay, the Voodoo, which, which, yeah. Yeah, which the Air Force was still using at that time. And Didn't uh, they use that in Cuba? also during the missile crisis yeah they did matter of fact one of the one of the aircraft that we received there at uh, at uh, meridian was five six one six six uh it's now sitting in the uh, air force museum in dayton ohio oh wow and the air force specifically requested that airplane when as we uh reached as began uh transition into the rf4 specifically wanted that airframe uh it had flown low-level missions in cuba photographing the soviet missile sites there prior to that it had uh, uh, uh established a transcontinental speed record and oh, wow. uh, 
and an operation they call the Sun Run. Uh, and then it, it served uh, quite a number of years in Southeast Asia uh, as in photo reconnaissance. And then, it, of course, it's uh, it came to Meridian as sort of its retirement home <laughs> after all that. But when it when it was time to uh, uh, for us to convert to RF fours, the, the Air Force specifically requested that airframe for. Uh, for the museum because of its history. Yeah, that's really cool. And of course, I mean, and you're thinking in your head, you know, by the time I'm done with this, uh, I can call Chuck Yeager back and say, hey, look, I've got the, all the different airframes right. under my yeah. belt now because you're getting a big variety of things. You mentioned that the um, the RF4 came in. So you were back to where you started. So you, you, got, your, you, got, your, you got your baby back. Yeah, after about a nine year uh, period, was away from it, you know, and it was like, uh, you know, say, you, you never forget how to ride a bicycle. Uh, it'd been a long time since I'd been in it. Now, obviously, it's a different model. It's an RF for which it yeah. doesn't have uh, some of the same instrumentation on the instrument panel. There's no bomb control panels or anything like that. There's now you've got uh, a big viewfinder in the, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, camera controls which most of them most of that is run by the uh, guy the back seater mm -hmm. the rf 101 was single seat so you did everything you had, yeah uh but uh yeah it was so comfortable yeah otherwise <laughs> everything looked the same flew the same and uh it was like being reunited with an old friend because i had gotten really really i don't know how you'd say it close to or bonded with an airframe uh, and by the time we lost we i left meridian to come over to jackson uh i guess I had about 3500 hours in in the f4 type aircraft the f4 c d yeah rf4 and even a little time in the f4 b's at the very beginning uh so yeah i really uh I can't think of the how he put it now, but Ernest Hemingway had a quote about how a pilot can become attached to uh, an airplane. It's sort of like a a romantic involvement, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's it's true. It really is true. Um, and that that's the way. Even though uh, been a long time, that's the way I still feel about that airplane. Uh, and uh you know i travel i travel a long way to see one fly again yeah and it, it had a distinctive sound it howled when it was in the traffic pattern that's the only way i'm described it howled uh and the and to listen to that was just to bring tears to my eyes now did but, they still uh, did, i mean i know they um they still use them as drones occasionally. Um, I think at this point they may not even do that anymore. They did. They don't. They don't. Yeah. They uh, they used them. I guess they used them all. Oh, okay. <laughs> now they're using F sixteens mm -hmm. as drones. The older, older uh, models. The A models. Yeah. So, well, the the F four is the one that you know brought you to the dance, but it's the one where almost you checked out of the dance too, um, it, which was one of my favorite stories of yours that you were flying one day and uh, had a close encounter of a very uh, uncomfortable kind with a turkey buzzard. Um, and, and I got to draw that. I was really, that's how we met actually indirectly, but yeah. I got to draw that moment. But you're, you so you're flying in Louisiana, you're low to the ground, you're doing around 500 miles an hour and you get hit by bird strike. And I don't think most people realize how serious bird strikes were until Sully had his encounter over the Hudson you know, over New York and landed, I mean, a bird will literally take a plane down, especially one that big. And that it just about did you in, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, just, I, I heard you mention something about that. Let me, uh, sort of correct you a, a little bit. I no, was that's fine. The, I was in the back seat when that happened. Okay. I, I was instructor pilot, our wing commander, uh, Colonel Bill Pittman, was getting a home station, what we call a home station checkout in the, in the RF four. Yeah. And, uh, and I was, had been assigned as his instructor 
and we'd known each other for a long time. He was my instructor in the RF-84. He's the one that leaned over the yeah. canopy rail and showed me how to start the engines of the darn thing. Anyway, uh, so we sort of reversed roles then. Yeah. But uh, uh, we'd finished the, the uh, transition part of the checkout within the tactical phase where he's, we're flying uh, training missions, uh, uh, photo reconnaissance training missions at low level, which is where uh, normally you did most of that work. Uh, and we had uh, we'd scheduled two missions. Uh, one uh, that morning, we'd land at England Air Force Base in Louisiana and then fly one back to Meridian. And we'd taken off from, uh, like I said, I was in the back seat, taken off from uh, England Air Force Base down near Alexandria. And uh, we're eastbound over the uh, uh, Atchafalaya Swamp. You know, cypress trees were mm -hmm. zipping by underneath us. We were uh, 480 knots, which is over 500 miles an hour. And uh, <clears throat> he's the front seat pilot, basically, in that environment is responsible primarily, first off, to, uh, to, to fly the airplane and, and, uh, and uh, avoid any anything out front as we would say keep it out of the, the dirt rocks and trees yeah and and uh or any other traffic or whatever uh and also navigate and the backseat pilot is responsibilities help navigate too and run the cameras mm -hmm. and um so at the time we're motoring uh pretty fast i just glanced down at our map which we use we used uh Basically, you use uh, in addition to what we call dead reckoning at that low, you can't pick up any nav aids or anything to help you navigate. You it's all pilotage, reading reading the maps and and navigating off the geographical features on the ground on the map. And uh, I just glanced down at the map, and it uh, it was an explosion. Uh, Colonel Pittman had seen the bird about a split second before it hit and had just instinctively jerked back on the stick. Uh, so it was an explosion. Uh, uh, it was this big uh, uh, pull up and then the airplane and he, as it hit him, knocked him unconscious. It came mm -hmm. through the, oh, the wow. right quarter panel and uh, knocked him out. A big part of it came back into the rear cockpit too, but Ooh, uh, yeah. I didn't take the full impact of it like he did. Uh, and so he released the control stick and the airplane went in sort of a corpus. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and I thought we had had a mid-air collision. That's what I thought. I'm trying to reach the, the uh, ejection handle between my legs, which would eject both of us. Because uh, I thought that that first instant, I thought that's what had happened, uh, but I couldn't get my hand on it because of the uh, the uh, the G force oh. up down negative G positive. Anyway, uh, it I, I I I grabbed the control stick and managed to get the uh, nose pointed up, and uh, I real when I realized just a second too late, we're still flying, we're not. Uh, and got it slowed down, got some altitude, swapped the uh, airspeed altitude. And uh, then I, it's obvious we got all this debris in the cockpit. Uh, we hit so I can see around his seat. And I see the, the right quarter panel and it's gone. Just, you know, some shards left in the, in the frame and uh, try and talk to him and I get no response. So we turned immediately back to, toward England Air Force Base. That's the nearest base. Get up a few thousand feet and declare an emergency and uh, start talking to uh, Air Traffic Control Center and getting uh, uh, heading back to, they give me vectors direct back to England and uh, start, and I can't get him raised on the, on the intercom. And finally, on the way, back there uh he starts mumbling i can hear sort of incoherent wow. sounds but thank good 
because I, I can't see him. I'm you don't around. know if he's dead or not. Yeah. I don't know if he's dead or if he's what. I look around the uh, side of his uh, seat, his ejection seat, and I see that broken out windscreen. And the side of his ejection seat, I can see his shoulder. I can see, and it's just, it just looks like a mass of hamburger meat. Ooh. And uh, and the uh, the ejection seat has a built-in parachute, and it's housed in a fiberglass container. That fiberglass container of his chute was busted open, and the shroud lines were just spilled out like spaghetti. Which is a good thing it didn't eject both of us because I don't think his chute would have opened. Yeah, given that condition. So then he finally he gets a little coherent, and I said, "Are you?" are you okay? He said, I can't feel anything on my right side. I said, uh, okay. Uh, I told him what we were doing. We we're heading back to England. I said, can you, can you use your left arm? He said, yes, I think so. I said, okay, well, great. Because I need you to do, I need you to do a couple of things as we get back. Uh, I need you to lower the landing gear. You can do that with your left hand. I need, when we're on the ground, I need you to deploy the drag chute, which you can do with your left hand. Uh, so, uh, and that's that's what he did. I could, I had emergency gear lowering and flap lowering. Oh, mm -hmm. I need I need to lower the flaps too, we do this, because all that's on the left side of the cockpit. Um, I, could, I could lower the gear, I could lower the flaps from the, uh, back cockpit but in and so doing uh it would rupture the uh utility hydraulic system which operated those systems but basically yeah. it just forced a lot of high, high compressed air into the hydraulic system uh to force force those uh, gear and the flaps down uh, but then i wouldn't have any brakes oh. uh, or, yeah. or nose wheel steering so I didn't want to do that unless as they had to. So by him being able to do it normally, that saved us from uh, being in a, having, having to uh, uh, use uh, emergency brakes and uh, would have had nose wheel steering. Plus it would have knocked out one of the uh, flight control systems. So that, uh, as we got close and got on final approach, he lowered the gear, he lowered the flaps, and uh, and we were able to. I was, since I was instructor pilot, I could land aircraft, not easy, but could land it from the rear cockpit. Yeah, because your your forward visibility, yeah, no forward directly forward visibility. It's just peripheral, and uh, on the runway, you can't really see the runway very well. But if you can't see it out either side, you must be lined up with it, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, until you get get on the ground, but it it uh, uh, as soon as we landed, got stopped, were able. I got out. Uh, oh, he could also. I couldn't shut the engines down from the rear cockpit either. Oh wow! I had troubles, but I didn't have cutoff position, so when we got it stopped. Uh, he was able to shut down the engines and. Uh, got out, made sure his ejection seat was not damaged anyway on the linkages and whatever. Got the canopy up. The ambulance was there. They helped me get him out of the cockpit and they loaded him up and headed off to Alexandria to the hospital with him. That's incredible. And, and so he recovered fully. He did. He did. Uh, fortunately, there were no there was no nerve damage and there were no broken bones. It was just a lot of muscle torn up and um, he had so much buzzard meat and stuff in there. Of course, they pumped him full of antibiotics. Yeah, because, because buzzards are pretty gross. So They are gross. And uh, <laughs> I had a little bit on me, but uh, yeah. it was, no. That is no. incredible. Seriously, Max, that is incredible that not only that he survived that and that he was able to assist in the landing, which I think is incredible. But the fact that with all that wind noise, with all that, that you were able to do a checklist in your mind to kind of figure out, okay, this is what we got to do next. And you stay calm and you managed to get the aircraft back to base and on the ground. 
Well, I think uh, training has a lot to do with that. Yeah. You know, you don't have to think too much about it. It sort of becomes, okay, it's just, it's, it's just sort of there instant, instantly and you just do it. And uh, so, yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, and things happen so fast too, like that. You, you don't have time to get scared. <laughs> you yeah. don't have time to think about it. You just react. And uh, that's where training really comes in is you, you just react and you react and then and, uh, uh, based on what you, what you have been trained to do, what you know. And uh, so, yeah, it's just, that's happened. That's happened a, a few times in my career where it just, you know, you don't have time to even yeah. uh, think about it ahead of time. It's just, okay, it's here and, you, and you're just, you're reacting. Yeah, like Tom Cruise says in the new movie, the new Maverick movie, if you think up there, you're dead or whatever, you like that. It's one of those things that you you don't even have time to think. You just do it. And also, too, and I will say this about the, the new Tom, not to promote the movie, but the new movie, one of the, one of the plot points on it is the fact that Maverick has done everything in his power to keep flying, which means he's turned down promotions and everything else. And I mean, you, you obviously go join the National Guard so you can continue so you don't end up flying a desk and on that. But, but that time did eventually come and you ended up as the, 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 command, the commandant, the commander of the 172nd here in Jackson, and, uh, which is one of the top, I mean, it's one of the top airlift groups in the, in the country. They've, they've just, the history of that place is I mean, it's it's really renowned. All the some of the great things that come out of there. When you were there, was when when you were there in the late '90s. Uh, you were a colonel at that time, and you, we that's when Sonny Montgomery helped get us the C-17s, and that was a big moment in the 172nd's history. Yeah, I came over in '90 as the vice commander, and then um, three years later, I became the the wing commander for another three years, and um, I'm so proud of that unit. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, it, it was a big change for me in mission. Yeah. And, and, and I knew very little about the airlift mission, but the more I was involved in it and, and understood it, the more appreciation I had uh, for what the job they did. We had, uh, at that time, we were flying the C-141. Yeah, which there again, they, that airplane had been in service a long time. It too was getting uh, a lot of uh, age on it. Um, and uh, one of the units there, uh, uh, in addition to the, the pilots, navigators, load masters, and the flight engineers, and was uh, a medical evacuation squadron. Mm -hmm. And particularly when the Gulf War started uh, back. Uh, those those folks, the nurses, the med techs, doctors did a heroic job. Yeah. Again, I wish I had the number on on the tip of my tongue, but it's in the thousands of the number of uh, GIs that were airlifted. I mean, injured, wounded, mm -hmm. airlifted out of uh, back to the states by uh, that squadron out here at the base. Uh, it it's it was amazing. That's one of the truly, um, I think, heroic things that uh, this this unit did. In addition to hauling all the cargo, you know, yeah. tons and tons and tons of cargo over there, and uh, I'm so proud of that unit. But yeah, like you talking about toward the, uh, I guess about uh, somewhere around the early '90s, uh, started thinking about. Well, what, what's going to be the follow-on aircraft? This 141 is not going to be around forever. And uh, the, Air, the Air Force had started, just started getting the uh, C-17s. Well, that's, if we want to stay in the airlift business, that's, that's what we need. Well, the Air Force, the active duty Air Force was holding very tight to their chest. They didn't want to share any C-17s with the Air Guard. They just didn't, and uh, but fortunately, at that time, uh, we had Sonny Montgomery in the house, who was a very powerful uh, uh, figure in the in the military. He was everybody looked up to Sonny Montgomery, uh, and we had Trent Lott in the Senate, 
who was the head of the Senate then. So we had that kind of horsepower in DC and we uh, got the, everybody on board, uh, including the Adjutant General here in Mississippi and uh, to lay down to our congressional delegation. This is what Jackson, the 172nd needs to keep it a viable unit far into the future. And uh, once we had them sold on that, they went to battle with the Air Force. And, and you see who won. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the 172nd then, I didn't ever, uh, my time was up at the 172nd before we, before we got to first C-17s, but we got the, we got the thing in, in motion. We got the train moving that way, which, uh, which brought the airplanes. And, uh, and now they've been out there for quite a long while. They have, and I mean, they they have definitely used, almost run the wings off of them going back and forth during, yeah. during Afghanistan and Iraq. And, you know, they continued that same mission of, of medical evacuation and, and did it really well. And I mean, and I, like I said, I, I spoke to a former loadmaster out there over the weekend in Madison when we were at the air show, and he was he was telling me about some of the exploits and back in the day and so forth. And so I've just, have always been really uh proud that that's that they're located here in Jackson. So, and it was kind of neat that you got to be in charge of that. And that was, that was your, your, your swan song, wasn't it for your career? Uh, yeah, it was. I, I spent a couple of years after that at, at state headquarters, but I'll tell you, the further I got away from the operational flying unit, the less I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just, that was my bread and butter for a long time. It's what I love doing. And I'm so, uh, in addition to my family, I am so, feel so fortunate to have been able to do uh, something I enjoyed so much. Did, did and, any uh, of your kids follow in your footsteps? Uh, Mark, sort of, kind of. Uh, <laughs> he, he, uh, he went in the Air Force. Well, actually, he joined the Air Guard at Meridian in his senior year in high school. Oh, wow and uh, and and served uh in the as a photo interpreter yeah uh for uh the five years that he was in in uh, in college it took him five years because he kept changing his major some much. yeah i but, understand how that works yeah <laughs> yeah but anyway after he uh graduated from, uh southern uh and had his degree Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to go in the Air Force, went to uh, officer training school, they called it then, got his commission, and um, wound up uh, in the uh, public affairs uh, mm -hmm. career field, which he loved. It was his niche. Uh, it's amazing how, I, I remember Mark, he initially started off in some other areas in the Air Force. Um, but when he finally found public affairs, um, he loved it. And I, uh, I remember him telling me, he was 30 or over. He said, Dad, uh, finally found what I wanted. What I've been awesome. looking for. Yeah. Maxie, thank you so much for joining us today. I know um, we've taken a bit of time, but I've just, I love the stories and I always love talking with you. Well, it's coming up on Memorial Day and um, it's special. It's a special time, and yeah. um, I'm glad we had a chance to talk and a little bit about what uh, what those guys, the one we should be honoring on Memorial Day. Amen. Thank you too yeah. for sharing the memories of your uncle and and um, you know of all the your squadron mates that that didn't make it back. And I know, you know that that's obviously something that gets on your mind this time of year. And thank you for sharing. Well, thank you, Marsha. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm gonna read this little. Um, little quick ad here real quick and then we'll we'll say goodbye how's that sound okay okay well the university of mississippi medical center who very kindly sponsors today's mississippi stories is the state's only academic medical center its education research and health care missions share the objectives of improving the health of the state's population and eliminating health disparities it's located here in jackson ummc encompasses seven health science schools including medicine 
nursing, health and related professions, dentistry, pharmacy, graduate studies and population health. The medical center's health and enterprise include the state's only level one trauma center, only children's hospital and only organ and bone marrow transplant programs. The medical center is home of the telehealth center of excellence and one only one of two in the nation. For more information, you can visit www.umc.edu. Maxie, I hope to run out uh, run into you again either we you've come to the coffees at broad street and i want to thank you for doing that and also too uh, it was great just seeing out your airport the other day at madison airport for the open house for the commemorative air force because that was just fun getting to hear all the speakers and and getting to be around the planes and i know yeah, how, yeah really was there were some great programs for there too so i mean as you can tell even though i do tend to get some of my facts wrong sometimes um i love aviation and i've just loved talking to you today Thank you. Pleasure to mine, Marshall. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for watching this episode of Mississippi Stories. Make sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Today YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified every time a new video uploads.